Welcome to Walt Disney's Carousel of Progress. Uh, you're in for a real treat. Ole, ole, it's show time. In the tiki 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 room, in the tiki 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 room. Little orange bird, little orange bird, in the sunshine tree, in the sunshine tree. Come on, everybody, let's we go. We all have sparks, imagination. Yeah. That's how our minds create creation. <laughs> right at the start of everything that's new, one little spark lights up for you. Oh. It's a world of laughter, a world of tears. It's a world of hopes and a world of fears. There's so much that we share that it's time we're aware. It's a small world after all. There's a great big beautiful tomorrow. Just a dream away. Well, it sounds pretty good. In fact, that's just the right spirit. W, w Radio, your information station. Hello, everybody, and welcome to the WDW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World information station. I am your host, Lou Mangello, and this is show number 265 for the week of March 11th, 2012. Join us this week as we travel back to the Hollywood that never was in our virtual journey down the streets of Hollywood and Sunset Boulevards recorded live at Disney's Hollywood Studios. Jim Corcus and I will transport you back to the golden age of Hollywood in the 1930s and 40s as we explore the different stories, history, landmarks, tributes, and the many more incredible and wonderful details that you may have missed. I'll also bring back an old segment for a chance for you to play and win and share more about what's coming up in the future before playing more of your voicemails at the end of the show. So sit back, relax, and enjoy this week's episode of the WDW Radio Show. The Hollywood that never was at Disney's Hollywood Studios is reflected in the sights, the sounds, and yes, even maybe the smells and tastes of both Hollywood and Sunset Boulevards. And as we pass through the archways and walk beyond the crossroads of the world, we are transported back in time to that golden age of Hollywood in the 1930s and 40s. And those two intersecting streets of Hollywood and, Bull and Sunset Boulevards, while they do sort of both reflect that overriding theme of, uh, of the Hollywood of the past, they actually both help to tell slightly different stories. And in the past, we have looked, taken a detailed look back at Hollywood Studios with Jim Corcus. So it's only fitting that I bring him back, have him don his favorite fedora, and wander the streets once again with me. Jim, welcome back. Oh, uh, thank you, Lou. Always a pleasure uh, to be on uh, this podcast. And uh, thank you to all the, the listeners, because uh, even today, as we were wandering around the park, checking out uh, material for future podcasts, uh, so many listeners came up and were so uh, gracious to, to say how much they uh, I enjoy these. It's, it's important to get those stories out there and to, to share those stories. And I thank you for this opportunity. And as you know, this is probably one of my favorite Disney theme parks because it's such an intimate experience. And growing up in Southern California in the uh, Hollywood area, I actually got to see a lot of that. And of course, I'm a huge fan of uh, Turner Classic movies and movies from the 30s and, and 40s. And uh, when Disney does something right, they really do it right. And they, they've really captured uh, uh, a, a sense of Hollywood today. You know, and, and one of the favorite podcasts I did with you is, is that walk we took down uh, uh, Hollywood Boulevard. I did as well because you learn so much, not just about Disney MGM slash Hollywood Studios history, but real Hollywood history. And you got a sense of the architecture and what it related back in, in real Hollywood and what Disney 
was trying to so and did, did so well, like you said, so accurately portray from this Hollywood history almost that that never was or that that golden age uh, of of what Hollywood was. And. Uh, but we ran out of time. There, there's never enough time. I enjoy talking with you uh, uh, so much. And uh, uh, so we had to stop. We didn't, never got a chance to cover Sunset Boulevard. So I'm glad we decided that today we're going to take a look at uh, uh, Sunset Boulevard. And uh, Well, I think, too, it, I think it ended up working out well because as people are going to see, as closely tied in as Hollywood and Sunset are to each other, they actually do tell different stories. There's a different timeline. There's a different sort of area that's reflected as we start going through. It'll become, it'll be sort of another Jim Corcus aha moment. It becomes sort of very apparent maybe they hadn't realized before. But even before we start making our way down Sunset mm-hmm. Boulevard, uh, sort of that real first expansion of Disney's Hollywood Studios, uh, we always have to relate it back to food, Jim. So we're <laughs> sitting at Starring Rolls Cafe where we had our breakfast. Again, very much tied in to the theming and the story of this area. But this actually sort of backs up into kind of where our story is going to begin today, and that's at one of my favorite places to eat in Walt Disney World. It's the Hollywood Brown Derby Restaurant. It's one of my favorites as well, too, especially for the uh, uh, Cobb salad. And, and yes, we're at Starring Rolls, which is a which is a, a nice uh, uh, pun. The original concept for this, though, was that the servers inside were supposed to be literally starving actors. And so as you were purchasing... I think some of them actually very well made. <laughs> <laughs> and so as you purchased your uh, your bagel or your orange juice or your coffee, they were supposed to be auditioning for you and or, or practicing for roles that they were going to be doing. But uh, again, there was the question of, of uh, uh, whether that overstepped the bounds of uh, entertainment because Disney has a uh, contract with... Uh, uh, equity. So uh, we certainly didn't experience that this morning of uh, uh, that type of persona. But yes, we're right next to uh, uh, the Brown Derby. And of course, one of the questions that uh, uh, a lot of people ask is, well, then how come it's not in the shape of a, a derby if it's if it's supposed to be the real derby? Well, that's because there were a lot of uh, Brown Derbies um, in the uh, uh, Southern California uh, area. Uh, the very first one in 1926 was opened on Wilshire Boulevard right across the street uh, from the Ambassador Hotel, and it was in the shape of a derby because Gloria Swanson's uh, ex-husband was uh, joking around and uh, with some friends and said, you know, uh, you could stick a restaurant in a, in a back alley, and as long as the food is good and the service is good, people will come there. You can even, you know, make it in the shape of this derby that I'm wearing. And, and so as a dare, literally made a brown derby restaurant and again was so popular but again if you're going to make a concrete structure in the shape of a derby there's no room to expand uh that derby so uh, the second one was opened um february uh february 14th valentine's day 1929 on uh, hollywood and vine and that was actually uh even though it wasn't in the shape of a derby that was the more popular one because it was close to the movie studios uh that's where the, the one where um uh, Walt Disney usually ate uh, with his uh, uh, wife Lillian. And so the, the one we have here at uh, Disney's Hollywood Studios uh, is a recreation of uh, that particular uh, restaurant. And when I say a recreation, that's really true because inside all of that ornamentation that you see, the uh, pictures on the wall, uh, all of those were copied from the uh, Brown Derby uh, itself to get that authentic uh, uh, feel. I, I guess one of the um, uh, gags or legends, of, of course, is the artist who was starving and he came in and uh, talked to the uh, owner uh, at the time and, and, and said, you know, I'll draw caricatures of these famous uh, uh, people for, uh, you know, for, for a meal and uh, apparently did that. But uh, he, he was hired to, to, and continued to do that. And uh, his last name, uh, they only remember the last part of it, Vich, V-I-T-C-H. Uh, but before World War II, he uh, uh, disappeared to go fight in the war. And so uh, other artists were brought in, uh, Jack Lane very prominently. And, uh, of course, there were other um, uh, uh, Brown Derbies, one in Beverly Hills. So they needed an awful lot of uh, different artists 
In fact, you and I discovered a Disney artist was one of the caricaturists. What did we discover? Yeah, so as you're sitting in the lobby uh, waiting to be seated, you'll find a number of not only characters on the walls, there's also a map of the, uh, the area in Hollywood, but as you walk towards the restrooms and the uh, much-missed catwalk bar upstairs, you'll find there's actually a photo of one of those caricatures actually being drawn, and you pointed out the fact that it's actually being drawn by Herbie Ryman. Uh, and he's uh, 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 sketching uh, Georgie Jessel at that uh, particular uh, point. I, I wonder where some of that artwork uh, ended up today, if anyone took photos of that. That's why it's always important to take uh, uh, photos and in fact uh, as you go in uh, some of the caricatures you might want to take a look for is there's one of uh, uh, Jimmy Dodd from the original Mickey Mouse Club and he even has his little uh, Mickey Mouse ears uh, uh, on and uh, then uh, one that's a little bit more ob obscure is uh, Bob Clampett. Uh, Bob Clampett uh, was the creator of Beanie and Cecil uh, but also as a teenager, he's the one who did the original design sketches uh, for his aunt, Charlotte Clark, to make the uh, first uh, stuffed Mickey Mouse dolls. And I, I, I shouldn't say stuffed because at, at Disney you are not able to find any stuffed toys. There is not a stuffed toy that you can purchase anywhere on Disney property. Because if something is stuffed, it is dead. So those are plush those are plush uh, because uh, they're still uh, alive. Um, at the Brown Derby, the, the reason the booths were so low is because celebrities would go there uh, to see and be seen. Uh, and uh, uh, phones would be brought to, to people's uh, tables. Uh, Jack Benny, every Thursday, came with his writers to sit at one of the booths to work on the, the show for the, for the next week. Uh, Hedda Hopper. Uh, came in and uh, uh, that's where a lot of her stringers, the people who were gathering Hollywood gossip, uh, came and, and met with her. That's one of the reasons the booths are as large as they are, is they were often used as sort of mini uh, uh, conference rooms. And uh, over here at the Hollywood and uh, uh, Vine version, we even have uh, over there towards the corner... Um, the Bamboo Room, which was a little private bar, which was very valuable, especially during Depression days, but uh, there was prohibition going on, so you don't want to, you know, do a, <laughs> do a lot of that. Um, and uh, uh, as I said, Walt uh, was a visitor because uh, Walt was a good friend of uh, uh, the uh, operator, Bob Cobb, uh, operated the one uh, in, uh, in Hollywood, and both... Um, uh, Bob and Walt were uh, huge uh, baseball fans, so they were on, on the um, advisory uh, uh, committee for the uh, uh, Hollywood Stars, which was the Pacific Coast League, which was a minor league, and they were later on the uh, board of directors for uh, Gene Autry's California Angels. So uh, Walt would often uh, stop uh, uh, by here. Now, do you have something favorite that you like to eat when you're, you're here? Because there's quite a lot of variety, Lou. I do, and of course you know where we're going to be heading with this. But let me, Jim, was Cobb not the original owner? Were there originally two other owners? Yes, uh, Herbert Sanborn. Yeah. And Wilson Misner? Yes, absolutely. And where can we find another reference to Mr. Misner? Why am I asking you? You know this already. <laughs> Somewhere in Walt Disney World. No, go right ahead, Luke. Go <laughs> right. I'm always willing to share the glory. Where can we find another reference to Misner? Just pretend that you're fascinated when I tell okay. you this. Because over in the Grand Floridian, uh, up on the mm -hmm. on the second lounge, one of the, my favorite lounges in all of Walt Disney World, you've got the Grand Floridian Society Orchestra playing there. Beautiful lobby. There was the very uh, cozy and comfortable and quaint Misner's now lounge up there as well. There, I am absolutely fascinated, Lou. I am, I am awestruck. I, I am always awestruck by 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 your uh, research here. Uh, yes, and and they were the uh, original owners. You know, we were talking about twenty six uh, and then twenty nine for the one in Hollywood. Uh, Thirty four is when um, Bob Cobb uh, took over the Hollywood one. And in 1937, something very famous happened. And because it's 1937, what does that mean? And it means that Bob Cobb's favorite song, It's On, It's On, is playing in the <laughs> <laughs> No, actually, since it was 1937, it means this year, 2012, is the 75th anniversary of this. 
Now, besides being friends with uh, Walt Disney, uh, Bob Cobb was uh, good friends with Sid Grauman. And Sid Grauman had, um, uh, uh, was an entrepreneur, had many different theaters, had the Million Dollar Theater, the Egyptian Theater, of course, uh, Grauman's Chinese Theater. And um, the, the uh, Brown Derby uh, in uh, Hollywood had a tendency to be open a little later, like 2, sometimes maybe 3 o'clock in the morning. Well, one night um, in 37, uh, Sid Grauman came by and was absolutely drunk. And so uh, Cobb realized that... I mean, you mean hungry, wasn't he? Hungry? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's the official uh, version, right? He was absolutely drunk, and so Cobb realized he couldn't sit him out in the regular dining room, even though there were just a, a couple of people, and they were just about ready to close, so he took him back into the kitchen, and he didn't want to send his friend home drunk, you know, g- got to get some food. But again, it, it's close to closing time here, uh, so he just reached and found... You know, what were some of the things that were already there that, you know, the prep chefs had, had, had put out, you know, for some of the meals that had been done that that day. So, you know, grab, grab the lettuce, grab the hard-boiled egg, uh, some bacon, all of that, and cut it up very finely uh, to, again, hold uh, Grauman's attention so he wouldn't go wandering off. He'd just be fascinated at how... No, he was having problems with his teeth, Jim Corbett. Oh, yes, he was having problems with his teeth. And so, anyway, did that all together, uh, had that, and then uh, Cobb uh, sent him home when he, he was fine. And then that next afternoon, uh, Grauman came in and, and sat at his favorite table and ordered a Cobb salad. And everybody wondered, what's a Cobb salad? What's, and when they saw that, that, you know, they were just so uh, uh, enthralled uh, that it became very, very popular. And uh, uh, Jack Warner, the big uh, movie producer, would uh, send his uh, chauffeur to come by and just pick up a Cobb salad to, to take it to the studio. And that's the thing, Jim. It's you know, it's we were talking about that level of authenticity, not just in architecture and story and details, but even the food, um, you know, the furniture, the, the the stylings in there, and the Cobb salad isn't the only thing. And, and we've eaten here in the past before, and to to really live the experience, and maybe today we should do that again. Uh, you know, I had not only the Cobb salad, but the legendary grapefruit cake, and the grapefruit cake. It, it, very funny. We talked about Hedda Hopper. Uh, her rival was uh, Luella Parsons, and Luella Parsons was uh, a well-fed woman, so she was <laughs> always going on uh, diets, and popular in Hollywood at the time was the grapefruit diet, the concept being that uh, if you ate grapefruit with protein, it burned off fat so you would lose weight. Uh, those of you who are familiar with the grapefruit diet know that basically what it does is it just flushes water from your system so as soon as you go off the grapefruit diet it all comes back and 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 more but Luella Parsons had literally said no I can't go to the uh, uh, brown derby anymore because I'm tempted by the desserts especially the chocolate cake and so uh, Cobb couldn't afford to have someone so important and valuable disappear from the brown derby so he came up with a grapefruit cake and said this is part of the grapefruit diet. Well, anyone who's had the grapefruit cake knows it's pretty much a cream cheese type, uh, a cream cheese icing on this cake, has more calories probably than the chocolate cake, but it made Luella Parsons happy and uh, uh, she kept uh, coming. Now, when Wait, he- wait, wait, so you're telling me that I'm going here thinking I'm ha- having a salad and grapefruit and it's not healthy? <laughs> well, you, you have to realize that on Disney property, uh, calories don't count. And, and this is absolutely true. Every dessert on Disney property is fat-free. Every dessert is fat-free. And I'm telling you that right now, that the fat comes with it absolutely free. You do not have to pay extra for the fat. It is fat-free. Right. And there are no <laughs> calories on Disney property. The problem is, Jim, look at me. When you step off Disney property, you, you, bro, you blow up like a, a blueberry from Willy Wonka. So all the calories kick in as soon as you leave. I, I thought that was the goofy hat cutting off <laughs> blood to your brain. So it just, you know, uh, adds. No, well, take a look at me. I, I, I'm in such a state now that you can tell that I'm coming into a room before I come into a room. But, uh, you know, and that was one of the legacies that Michael Eisner said he was going to leave for Disney. He said he was going to leave two uh, legacies. One was entertainment architecture and one was culinary. And I will, I will certainly say that the culinary choices 
uh, at uh, Disney theme parks are just absolutely wonderful. And uh, their variety, something for everyone uh, as that goes. But, uh, you know, the, the beat of the music in the, in the background there, and that's what happens when, yes, folks, we actually record in the parks. This is not done in a, in a nice, comfortable little room with uh, uh, Lou's entourage peeling us grapes <laughs> and uh, rubbing our sore feet and all of this. We're, we're actually out here with you so that we can give you a sense and point out where you can find these things. Uh, we're going to start in... Um, just a little bit our our walk down Sunset Boulevard now you need to realize since I grew up in California I I can tell you this is Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard never intersected they're parallel they're parallel the Sunset by the way is part of the famous uh, Route 66 and so we're going to be taking that trip uh, down uh, Route 66 we're going to be making uh, some discoveries one of the ones that Lou alluded to is that Hollywood Boulevard uh, is uh, really references uh, the Hollywood of the 30s, and it's the business district. You see a lot of the uh, businesses there. When we get onto Sunset, we're going into the theater district, and we're going into the 40s, and basically it's continuing chronologically uh, the story that we followed in Hollywood Boulevard. So, Jim, we're now standing literally on the corner of Hollywood and Sunset Boulevard, the Disney version of Hollywood and Sunset. As you said, they never actually intersect out in California. We have really traveled back in time. Radio Disney did not exist, or Disney Channel Rocks did not exist back then. So in the background, we can vaguely hear some music of the turn of the of of that part of uh, uh, of the decade in the 30s and 40s. And even where we are right here, Jim, is really kind of where the story begins because a lot of what we see here, like we talk about in Hollywood, reflects buildings and architecture and places that were very much present in Hollywood, and also starts to tell the story as we go down Sunset Boulevard. Right, and I absolutely love uh, uh, the theming, uh, Lou, because, again, uh, we're starting our journey. As I said, we're going uh, chronologically as we uh, uh, go down, and, uh, again, we're starting, uh, you know, into the the 30s, actually right at the beginning of the 30s, uh, 1928. Uh, As we can see across the street, we have the Pacific Electric... uh, uh, trolley, and in fact, that's why that doorway is so large, so the trolleys can come out. And overhead, we see the electric line, and behind the tip board, we've got the the map of of the route. This this was so popular in the in the uh, 30s and uh, uh, 40s, uh, uh, you know. And uh, it says 1928 up there, but I can tell you that the Pacific Electric Trolley was founded in 1901. So 1928 up there re- uh, refers to what, Lou? I was going to say your birth year, but I don't want you to pound me right here. Certainly that, that is, references the birth date of Mickey Mouse, and it's not the only place here on Sunset that we can find that. And, and where's the other thing? Right across the street from Pacific Electric Trolley, right here on the uh, curb, what do we find? Well, we always say to look up, and we also have to look down, too, because there you'll see Mortimer and Company Contractors, 1928. And... Mortimer, and so how does that relate to Walt? I can play dumb. And in fact, not only can I play dumb, sometimes I actually am dumb. Uh, so how does that relate to Disney there? Well, certainly everybody knows the story of you know the, the famed train ride with Walt and Lillian as they're going uh, cross-country. Walt Disney has this idea for a, a, a little mouse character that he wants to call Mortimer. Smartly, as he often did, Walt Disney checked with his wife first. She didn't like the name Mortimer, and that's where Mickey got his name. You're absolutely uh, correct. You know, and, and in most, uh, in some parks, you begin your journey on a, on a train. And so here in Hollywood, the journey down Sunset, you're, you're beginning it with the Pacific uh, Electric uh, Trolley, the red cars. And we saw the billboard down at the uh, uh, entrance of Hollywood Boulevard for that. And uh, some people know about the red cars from uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit. And uh, later, it, it was a wonderful mass transit system, connected all of the... You literally could go from the mountains to the ocean. You went to Orange County and... Uh, Los Angeles County and Ventura County, all of those, those things. And this is where you would begin your uh, uh, journey. And so uh, I think it's very clever that the tip board is set up so it shows arrivals and departures, but it literally lets us know, you know, uh, if we go to this destination, when is this going to be open, uh, whatever. And in front of it is Mulholland Fountain, which is uh, on Las Feliz Boulevard. 
Of course, the real Mulholland Fountain is much, much larger. In fact, it is so large that if you are a foolish high school student with a bunch of friends, you can skinny dip in that fountain. You're not speaking I, from experience, I am not admitting to anything. <laughs> That, that, there's a vision I have to get out of my mind's eye as quickly as possible. <laughs> well, to try and envision high school, where, where we all look better, right? Uh, and Mulholland, of course, was the guy who um, uh, borrowed water uh, for uh, Los Angeles. Let's put it uh, uh, that way. Um, and, in fact, his offices were on the top floor of Sid Grauman's uh, Million Dollar Theater uh, down there in Hollywood. But, but the wonderful uh, uh, design here, uh, you know, even the information center. And, and along the side here, you see even the merchandise and all is set up like uh, uh, baggage. So it's waiting for a, a car to come pick it up or, or you to load it on to the next trolley or... Uh, whatever, as that uh, goes through. But, you know, one of the things we were talking about was that this is really the uh, uh, theater district. And as you start walking down here, I think you can immediately see it, don't you? Absolutely. And again, <clears throat> keeping that in mind as you walk down, you can very much see that. But also keep in mind, as we and as you make your journey down Sunset, this idea of the cable car. And if you watch, you'll see on the left-hand side how that cable extends all the way down to Gower Street at the very end. We'll also walk by an actual cable car that's here. And again, that too has a story and a purpose behind it. And Jim, at one point early in in the concepts for Hollywood Studios, didn't they actually have an idea for having a, a real sort of trolley car going up and down the street? Yes, they did. And, and in fact, where we're standing right now, um, uh, when the park opened, this was the... Uh, uh, Hollywood Theater of the Stars. <laughs> and so you had shows like uh, uh, Dick Tracy and uh, the Diamond Double Cross and the Hollywood's Pretty Woman and, and all of this. So, uh, And in a couple more steps, we'll, we'll probably be in the uh, uh, back dressing room where all those wonderful Disney uh, chorus girls with the legs that go on forever used to... <laughs> the ghosts of them, the spirits of them <laughs> as that goes through. Uh, because uh, when this uh, park opened, of course, uh, Michael Eisner conceived it as a half-day attraction. Uh, they always labeled uh, Disney attractions in terms of, of days. So, for instance, uh, going to Magic Kingdom is a two- to three-day attraction. You need to spend two to three days to be able to see everything you want to see. Uh, Epcot is about uh, a, a two-day attraction. Uh, something like a Typhoon Lagoon or Blizzard Beach were considered half-day attractions, that you might go there in the morning and then you went over, uh, you know, and finished out at the park, or you started your day at the park and then, you know, uh, you uh, halfway through the day you went to Typhoon Lagoon. But what happens to those people who don't like water parks or whatever? This was going to be, you know, a half-day attraction. And, of course, a lot of the infrastructure... Uh, the plumbing, the electricity, and all of this had uh, already been laid because it's right near Swan and Dolphin. So all, when all of that was being put in, you just extend that. So that's why the location of the park is where it is. But there used to be the Theater of the Stars here, and instead of Cinema Storage next door used to be uh, a Screen Test Theater. Mm -hmm. But we talk about the theater district, and as we step in, we see the Beverly Sunset Theater, and it's based after a real theater. It was based after the Warner Beverly Hills Theater uh, on uh, Wilshire, and then right across the street, the Legends of Hollywood was based on the Academy Theater, which was um, uh, not on Sunset. In fact, one of the things that we're going to, to find very uh, uh, quickly is that... Um, very few, if any, of these structures were on there at all. Inglewood. Uh, Academy Theater was in Inglewood. See, that's what happens when you have so many things in your, <laughs> your mind. You know, uh, I, I can't remember my own phone number or where I live or what I ate for last lunch, but I can pull those things up. And uh, the Academy Theater was where they were going to have the Academy Awards. That's why you have a car out front, because they're coming to a premiere. See, and you have the ticket booth out there. And then behind that, and again, they, they need to do some landscape uh, trimming, is the billboard uh, for the Hollywood uh, Tower Hotel. But again, it's in such disrepair, that's supposed to create that sense of foreboding. So you go, wait, that's a fancy hotel. Why are they not taking care of that? So uh, again, just like in a story, you're giving a sense of uh, foreboding as, as you go uh, down through that. And again, one of the things I love about... Um, uh, the Villains in Vogue is as you go into the Beverly Sunset Theater here, 
uh, the uh, it, it's done up like a concession stand, the, the counter and uh, all of that. But you know, one of the things uh, we like to do is we like to talk about things that people usually uh, bypass. So let's go right past the Academy Theater because I think there's a location. Maybe you don't even know. Let's go take a look. Oh, another Jim, another Jim Crocus aha moment coming. And so if you quickly walk inside the Legend store, the first thing you'll see in sort of the beautiful lobby area here, uh, again, that, that great Art Deco styling in here um, is just wonderful. And the mural on the back wall, if you look, it sort of represents not just the Chinese theater, but the other theaters that you're going to see that are represented here on Sunset Boulevard, including the Sunset and the Carthay Circle Theaters. If you look around, it, you see sort of the, um, the screens that are used to sort of bounce light. And on the walls, there are framed photographs. And if you look very carefully, you'll see that all of the photographs on the walls are from uh, Hollywood starlets. There are no male actors. They're all female actresses from the 30s and 40s. And so, Jim, as we step outside and pause by one of the shop windows here, as we often do, whether we're talking about Main Street or Frontierland or wherever it might be, we always sort of laugh and lament about how people are rushing down to get to Tower of Terror or Beauty and the Beast or, or Rock and Roller Coaster, and oftentimes don't stop to look in because a lot of times what's displayed in the windows isn't necessarily just merchandise you can buy inside, but they are little vignettes. There are little stories that are being told that help to complete the overriding story. And this is a great example of one, not only for the Legends building, but for Sunset Boulevard as a whole. Uh, absolutely. You know, uh, we're, we're just past the uh, uh, Legends of Hollywood, just by the uh, outside side door on the Sunset side that uh, leads in. And we're looking in the, the window, and besides the uh, many and colorful Duffies, um, which are a recent addition... We see the original uh, edition, which is in the back there, the uh, script uh, for a Disney short cartoon, Mickey's Gala Premiere, that premiered in uh, 1933, and it's Mickey going to a Hollywood premiere at a big uh, uh, movie theater, which, again, the illusion is that it's uh, uh, one of Sid Grauman's theater, because Sid Grauman's taking tickets on, on the outside there. And, and we see some photos uh, from there, and uh, uh, we've got Mickey here. And, and this Mickey's Gala premiere is, is a, um, a milestone uh, uh, film. In fact, uh, the BBC, that was the last thing the BBC ran before it went dark for World War II. And it was the very, and that was in 1939. And then uh, when it uh, started up again in um, the 40s, that was the very first thing that they ran to show that, you know, uh, life continues on. You know, there was a, a little hiccup there called World War II, but we're, we're the same and, and we go on. And, and, and so, you know, uh, very delightful and, and all of the, the film cans. And, uh, of course, you know, across the, the street at uh, Villains in Vogue, you know, we'll see uh, film cans along the side. They used to have a huge projector that uh, went onto a screen where the uh, curtains pulled apart. So uh, very uh, theater-oriented. Actually, the Beverly... Uh, uh, Sunset Villains and Vogue building is divided into three sections. There's that, that one that's based on the Warner Beverly Hills Theater, and then the middle section, which is sort of that uh, lime green, uh, that was actually um, a Pasadena Winter Garden uh, ice rink, which became a, uh, a post office. Now it's a storage unit. And then uh, towards the end of that is uh, the 35er, which was a, a club. But uh, I, what I love uh, at Disney MGM Studios is... Uh, reading some of the windows because because they have uh, references to to films and and all of that and that's uh, uh, very funny. Let's cross the street here and uh, take a closer look at some of those uh, 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 windows there. And uh, you know we were talking about Mickey's Gala premiere in there, and again there's lots of other little details that that point to that, including some screenshots from the film. And, and you and I actually had a chance to watch that short together which was a joy because I, I sort of got a director's cut of, of the film as we were going through because you were talking about it. And it's so appropriate, obviously, because of the time, because throughout that film, much like in the Hollywood Brown Derby, there are a lot of caricatures of celebrities who 
would get lost in a lot of people today, but were very much, you know, the superstars of their time. Well, and, you know, also what happens is uh, people who are listening to this podcast need to realize that this is just sort of a uh, Cliff Notes uh, classics <laughs> illustrated comic book version because just crossing the street, uh, we bypassed two <laughs> wonderful things uh, of detail. The uh, the uh, mailbox that's right outside 94, right across the street there, it says buy war bonds. So we already realized we're going into the uh, the 40s. We also passed the, the sign for Route 66. And I mentioned that Sunset Boulevard was part of Route 66. But Route 66 went from uh, Chicago to uh, uh, Hollywood. And we know that there's a very famous person went from Chicago to Hollywood, and that's Walt Disney. But uh, let's take a look up uh, the windows at the uh, tail end here of uh, Villains in Vogue in the in the building that represented the 35er Club, which uh, still exists today, to the best of my knowledge, as, a, as a, a bar. And up there it says, International Brotherhood of Second Assistant Directors, you know. Uh, an assistant director is, is one of those ones who uh, covers uh, some of the shots uh, to, to save on budget and time. Oftentimes it's an action shot. There's people crossing the street or whatever. You know, you don't need to have a, a Steven Spielberg or a, or a George Lucas or, or uh, whatever sit there and, and direct that. You can have an assistant do that. It builds up an awful lot of... Uh, uh, a practice and experience, but a second assistant director gets no respect whatsoever. You know, so you get the the lowest. And so, if if we read uh, uh, the initials of International Brotherhood of uh, uh, Second Assistant Directors, what what does it spell, Lou? We see, of course, that I be sad. I be sad, and and I'd be sad too if I was a second assistant uh, director. We also see M- Muscle Beach uh, bodyguard and Sunset Boulevard. Um, just like Santa Monica Boulevard, uh, would take you right to uh, uh, Santa Monica. And uh, uh, just below the Santa Monica Pier was uh, Muscle Beach. Now it's in Venice, but uh, Hollywood Venice. But uh, it, uh, in uh, Santa Monica, Muscle Beach, and that's where a lot of the actors would work out. You, uh, Steve Reeves, who did Hercules, you know, did that because the city actually supplied some uh, uh, bodybuilding equipment. So you, it was also great for shots like, you know, these muscle men lifting women uh, over their heads, all of that. And right around the corner is, is something that relates to Sunset. Yeah, and this is one of those places, Jim, that most people don't go. It's one of those little tucked away nooks and crannies. And again, if people do take the time to sort of wander around and explore a little bit and, and look up a little bit, there's another great reference, a movie reference. Right. Max's uh, Classic Directing Academy, the latest movie techniques. Are you ready for your close-up? And this refers to a very famous film, uh, Sunset Boulevard, which was released in 1950. And uh, Eric von Stroheim... Um, played a uh, director by the name of uh, uh, Max, who is now a chauffeur for Gloria Swanson, a faded uh, silent uh, movie star. So that's where Max Classic Directing Academy comes from. And of course, the uh, one of the famous uh, lines from the film is uh, when Gloria Swanson says, I'm ready for my close-up, Mr. DeMille. So, so again, you know, only Disney would take the time to put up such a wonderful piece of detail in a little hidden, out-of-the-way nook and cranny. And, and even on the wall, we see uh, uh, a Mar- U.S. Marines recruiting poster, which again is leading us into the story that we're going into the 40s, we're going into uh, World War II. Yeah, and that, and that sense of it being wartime is really going to be uh, sold as we go farther down Sunset on the left-hand side, as we go towards the back of the Sunset Ranch Market. Across the street, though, is uh, Sunset Club Couture. Again, beautiful, again, level of detail that they put into all the architecture here. You really get that California feel as you look down this alleyway towards the restrooms. (laughs) <laughs> and uh, right next to uh, Sunset Club Couture. And, and, of course, next time you're down, go take a look and see what's up there on the window. We're not going to tell you because I think you should come down and explore some of this on your own is Mouse About Town. And in there, uh, you'll see some photos of uh, Walt as uh, an athlete, including uh, Polo. 
Um, so you'll see uh, uh, him with uh, some of the folks like uh, Jack Holt, who is the leader of the uh, polo team, all of that. So, uh, again, a nice little, we should do a podcast sometime of where in the world is Walt and find the Walt references in Walt Disney World. But, yes, we're right at Sunset Market, which, of course, was uh, inspired by Farmer's Market, which was created in uh, 1934. And, in fact, we're, we're looking at the Toluca Legs uh, uh, turkey Company, and we're not going to debate whether that's really turkey legs or not, uh, or if it's some other creature in the turkey family. Um, 60 pound turkey. A, a velociraptor oh, legs, so yes. Delicious turkey fried and, and, goodness. And again, this used to be Fairfax fries because um, uh, Farmer's Market uh, is on 3rd in Fairfax, so that's where that came from. So in 1934, basically, uh, a couple of guys came up with the idea of. You know, let's put together a, a farmer's market. You know, farmers uh, bring in their produce. They grow produce in Southern California, bring in the tr- trucks on the weekend, and people can buy off of that. A lot of people are familiar with the concept of a farmer's market. Well, they thought, why don't we build uh, some permanent stalls, and then we'll rent out those stalls, you know, like at uh, 50 cents a day, uh, so that people uh, can do that. And so it, it grew from there. But we know that this is not 1934 because we see uh, the clock tower in the back there. And we know that the clock tower didn't come until the the 40s. And uh, so this is a a wonderful little sort of uh, tribute to that area. And, of course, it's also a tribute to Hollywood because the real farmer's market in Hollywood was right next to the studio where uh, Johnny Carson and Carol Burnett did their shows. So you might go to the farmer's market to try and... uh, uh, grab a little uh, bite to eat, and what would happen is there'd be people trying to give you tickets so you could come in and uh, uh, see those shows. Let's let's explore the farmers market. Let's go, uh, or actually the Sunset Ranch market. Uh, let's go in um, uh, uh, to this and and explore, and uh, let's head over to Rosie the Riveters because that has a, a, an awful lot of reference to. Uh, uh, World War II, uh, the 40s, and uh, again, some wonderful uh, uh, detail that uh, people may have missed. Uh, what do you know about Rosie uh, the Riveters? Well, so again, it's sort of the, the, the wartime era, Rosie the Riveter was a popular song of the time, and it was sort of, it, it wasn't, Rosie the Riveter herself was not based on uh, any one individual, although, although I know it was attributed at one point to uh, a single woman, but what she represented was the effort of women to take over a lot of men's jobs during wartime while they were out uh, at war. So Rosie the River, for example, would have been a factory worker who would have been helping to uh, construct things for the wartime effort, and she sort of embodied uh, that, that spirit of the women to take over those men's factory jobs. And when you're ordering here, uh, uh, take a look at the little side panels, take a look at the back wall, and you'll see some authentic uh, items uh, from uh, World War II, some uh, uh, photos and posters and toys, even some uh, insignias that uh, Disney did. And in fact, if you can't get close enough to see that, just come around to the side and you'll take a look up there. And there is the insignia for the Flying Tigers. And that was the very first insignia that the Disney Studios did uh, for the U.S. military. That was done uh, by Roy Williams, the big musketeer on the original uh, Mickey Mouse uh, uh, one. And that was done as a favor. And as soon as that one got done, Walt was flooded with uh, requests. It ended up doing uh, roughly about uh, 1,200 of them at a cost of uh, 35 to 50 bucks a piece, although he didn't charge any of the military branches for that the Disney Studios more or less ate that cost themselves. And uh, the primary artist was uh, Hank Porter, but um, uh, other ones, uh, other artists like uh, Bill Justice uh, did that uh, uh, as well. So uh, that's a wonderful reference. And in fact, over here, when you go get your condiments and your uh, uh, plastic uh, forks and knives, you'll take a look in there. And those are uh, authentic uh, World War II uh, uh, toys. Yeah, uh, you see, there's toys and there's looks like uh, medals and ribbons in there as well. Mm-hmm. And and so you know, those type of things cost money, <laughs> you know. And yet Disney has done this, um, you know, so well. There's and, even old uh, ration books there in mm-hmm. the first one as well. 
there you go. Keep them flying the, the whole bit. And right next to uh, Rosie's is Catalina Eddie's. And, you know, we, we keep talking about logical, erroneous conclusions where where people have a little, a little bit of knowledge is a dangerous thing. They'll immediately jump to some conclusion. And so I've had people say, well, Catalina Eddie's, this is a reference uh, to um, Eddie Valiant in uh, Who Framed Roger Rabbit because he went to uh, uh, Catalina. But no, an Eddie is like a wave. So in Catalina, uh, Santa Catalina, the island of romance, romance, romance. And again, when you're uh, uh, picking up uh, your cheese pizza or your... Uh, garden salad, whatever, uh, take a look in the shelves along the back and, and along the wall there, and you see some wonderful, wonderful, uh, uh, authentic uh, pictures from that time period. And, of course, uh, my favorite is right next to Catalina Eddie's, which is the Victory Garden, because in World War II, one of the things that they, they tried to push was that people should grow their own um, uh, vegetables and all that so that farmers could send their produce to... Uh, uh, the troops uh, overseas. So over here, in keeping with that time period, uh, you've got a victory garden. And right over here is the sign, Victory with Vegetables, Rosie's Victory Garden. And you th see three dots and a dash. Do you have any idea what that means, Lou? Are you old enough <laughs> to know what that means? Is that old Morse code? Is that S-O? Actually, that is Morse code. Da, 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 da. <laughs> but da, 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 da is also the opening of Beethoven's Fifth Symphony. And so a Fifth Symphony is with a... V. V. V for victory. And, and again, it, it's just hidden uh, along in, in, in the back here. What, what, a, what a wonderful uh, little touch uh, for, for, for that... Uh, uh, to, to happen, you know? Yeah, and I was here uh, not too long ago, and I was actually taking photos inside, behind the counter over at Rosie's. And you can see in there, if you look very carefully, you'll find her lunchbox and welding equipment. You'll find uh, all kinds of bulletin boards with clippings about the Flyboys and the Working Girls. And there's a picture of, of FDR in there as well. Uh, there's an old um, uh, newspaper article in there. There's defense bonds in there. And there's even letters from mm. Rosie's, Rosie's guy, Rosie's man who's uh, off to war, who's not identified by name because the bottom of it's actually covered. And, of course, once again, I get strange looks from the people wondering why I'm not ordering anything to eat there, but instead looking at the details. And next time you're up uh, and over by Rosie's, you should see what you can find as well. It really helps to sort of, again, sell that idea of a story that's going on and really setting a time and place, again, like a Main Street or a Liberty Square. And, uh, again, we want to emphasize that, you know, uh, we're just touching on a, on a few things. Some of these might be things that you have missed or uh, didn't even know about. Um, but if you come down and explore for yourself, you'd be surprised at the things that you'll discover on your own. And uh, right now we're at the corner of Highland and Sunset where we've got the Carthay Circle Theater, which is now going to be uh, the new primary icon, uh, I guess, for Disney's California uh, adventure. Uh, this theater no longer exists. In 1969, it was uh, uh, pulled down. And again, it wasn't on Sunset Boulevard either. <laughs> we have Sunset Boulevard, and none of the icons we have here are from Sunset. Um, basically, what happened is this was, was uh, pulled down in 69 because it was not uh, earthquake uh, uh, safe. But it, very, very hi historic. Uh, when uh, Walt made uh, the first Silly Symphony, Skeleton Dance, uh, his distributor says, nobody wants to see dancing skeletons. That's, that's gruesome. You know, send us more mice. And so um, the owner of the Carthay Circle Theater uh, literally uh, premiered it for a week, and Walt took those reviews, laudatory reviews, to convince the distributor that, yes, Skeleton Dance, you know, could be uh, a hit. But, of course, the most famous premiere was uh, December 37 with Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And uh, right along on the outside of the street, they, they set up a, uh, the dwarf's cottage and, and a, um, a water wheel and a, a garden. And, and, and they had a huge display outside the theater of uh, original cells right out in the direct sun. So I'm sure they shriveled <laughs> up and died within, within days. But, uh, you know, showing how the film 
uh, was being made. And of course, Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs was the highest grossing movie of all time until Gone with the Wind came out and Gone with the Wind premiered at the Carthay Circle Theater. Uh, the following year, Fantasia premiered. And in fact, Carthay Circle Theater uh, was one of um, uh, two theaters uh, that was completely outfitted with uh, Fantasound. So you would have heard it exactly the way uh, uh, Walt wanted you to hear it. Uh, John Culhane, who's an animation historian, was telling me that as a kid he attended um, uh, the presentation in New York where the theater had it outfitted. And he said, uh, during the Sorcerer's Apprentice scene, you're sitting there and you could hear the water behind you and then rushing up along the sides of the, the wall and then just splashing on, on the screen. Um, if which, I heard, is, which is part of the reason why he won an honorary Oscar for the for the the, the sound in Fantasia. Ab- absolutely, you know, uh, Fantasound uh, actually inspired Dolby and and all the others that uh, uh, we have today. And but it all started here at the Carthay uh, Circle. And and both Lou and I know that. You know, you're going to be sharing this with your friends and family, and not one of them is going to say, "Did you ever hear this from Lou and Jim?" <laughs> They're going to say, "You're just so amazing. How do you know all of these things?" And uh, right across the, the street, what do we got over here, Lou? Well, we have what is obviously not the original uh, Theater of the Stars, because again, we talk about the sunset being sort of the first major expansion of Disney's Hollywood Studios, and. Uh, this is uh, much more elaborate than the original Theater of the Stars that was at the top of uh, uh, Sunset. This is uh, uh, to um, replicate uh, the Hollywood Bowl. And again, Beauty and the Beast uh, playing now, and uh, your children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren and more uh, will be seeing Beauty and the Beast playing in this theater. But one of the little details that you shouldn't miss is that as you go up and around before you enter the theater, take a look down at your feet and you'll see some of the handprints and footprints uh, that uh, were originally meant for the front of Grauman's Chinese Theater. But it's it's folks that uh, most folks don't know nowadays, Tom Poston, all of that, <laughs> because uh, Disney started off with the, uh, um, the whole uh, star, of the the day. Day, yeah. Yeah, star of the day, yeah, star of the day. Uh, for that uh, to happen. And again, we have Fairfax Fair down at the uh, uh, very end here, uh, again, referencing that uh, Farmer's Market was on uh, Fairfax. But, Lou, you teased something a little earlier about one of the red cars that uh, is still on the line uh, over here. We see the pole going up to the electric line. It stopped there. What do you know about this one? Well, and even if you go farther down as you approach the corner of Gower, you'll see that the blacktop is actually, it's crumbled up. And underneath, you can find sort of the original street, that uh, brick paver street, and some of the old trolley tracks that would have actually followed the line of the trolley car this way. But if you look and see the, uh, when the sides are up, it would say sort of the, the Pacific. And it says 694, which is obviously of June of 1994, when this extension of Sunset Boulevard opened up. And, and, and again, you know, if you don't know that, you can still appreciate Sunset Boulevard. You can still uh, appreciate the experience of being at Disney's Hollywood Studios. But to me, I find that, that some of these details actually enrich that e- experience. Because I- I've explained to people that when I come to a Disney park, the moment I enter, there seems to be a different feeling. Now, for some parks, it- it's much more... Uh, intense for me. So, for instance, when I'm on Main Street or when I'm here in uh, Hollywood or Sunset Boulevard, it really is I'm transported to uh, uh, an entirely different world. And yes, as, as you approach Rock and Roller Coaster, it becomes even more evident, as Lou was, was saying, that the original street was just paved over uh, for cars. But as you come a little closer towards uh, uh, Tower of Terror, Make sure you see right over on the left, it says Sunset Hills Estate, established 1928, you know, which, of course, uh, we began our journey in 1928. We're ending it in 1928. Um, But these are actually the entranceways uh, on both sides here to uh, what was Hollywoodland, which was the uh, uh, real estate uh, um, uh, development 
uh, area there. And, and, and these gates still exist. They were built, and they were built this way to indicate that this was a classier area uh, that, that you were going into. And, of course, uh, just down the way, uh, Tower of Terror. But, uh, of course, that's a whole another podcast on its own. But, but to give you a little bit of a, of a tease there, you do not go through the entrance of the hotel to get to the ride. You come out the entrance. You come out the entrance. <laughs> the, the exit is actually the Portica Share where, where cars are, are dropping you off and limos and, and all of that and valet parking. You're going in through a side entrance, which should already give you pause that there, there's uh, uh, something wrong. And a very Haunted Mansion-esque entrance. <laughs> <laughs> yes. And, and, and the video was directed by uh, Joe Dante, who directed a segment for the Twilight Zone movie. But the set that he used, he filmed it in Hollywood, was taken apart and then reconstructed here so that the lobby looks exactly like the set does um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in the movie. And... Uh, you know, there's all sorts of things. The, the Mahjong players, I know I was blown away the first time this was explained to me. And I said, well, I don't know anything about Mahjong. And they said, well, we brought in professional uh, uh, players, you know, to, to do this. So people who did know that, you know, the game and where it is. They said, but you're missing the most important thing. So I'm, I'm squinting. And, and again, remember what my dad always told me. He says, it's okay to look like an idiot for five minutes if you look like a hero for the rest of your life. So uh, this is my hero moment here now. What has happened is they're in the middle of a game, but the chairs are not pushed away from the table. So they didn't get up and leave. They just disappeared. And again, the, the, the process of Tower of Terror is not supposed to be like Haunted Mansion where people are, are dead. Uh, as the Imagineers explained to me, the concept here is that it's frozen in time. It's frozen in 1939. The bellhops and all are supposed to be acting as if it's 1939, and you're a VIP guest who has come here. That's what's supposed to make it uh, spooky. And, of course, just down the way, uh, rock, uh, rock and uh, roller coaster there um, with Aerosmith, and, and I think it's, it's very daring of uh, Disney to have an attraction based on a, a rock band that... Uh, is old enough to be members of AARP. <laughs> but uh, the storyline there of how that fits in with 1940s and 50s Hollywood is that was supposed to be a record studio from the 30s called Tip Top Records. And Tip Top Records, that's because in Tower of Terror you had the Tip Top Club up there. You know? The Anthony Fremont Orchestra. Oh, my God. And who was Anthony Fremont? We're going to send you to the cornfield <laughs> is what we're going to do. You know, I, you did a good thing there, Anthony. You did a real good thing. Um, and uh, so uh, what happened is they were supposedly hosting the Halloween party in 39 when the lightning struck and caused all the, the, the problem here. And so they closed down and then they later reopened but because they didn't want to be associated with that disaster, they changed their name to G-Force Records. And that's the story, and that's the story they're, they're selling. Um, I don't. And it make, listen, it makes sense. If you put it together, you're like, all right, I can buy that. Well, in fact, Lou and I were both talking about, you know, uh, the thing you have to be careful with with a theme is when you make changes of, you know, now you have to shoehorn in. You know, and, and that's what happened at uh, Pleasure Island uh, was, you know, you, you had this strong theme. But as soon as one of those buildings closed, that, you know, interrupts the story of uh, Meriwether Pleasure. And as, as soon as you put in something else, how do you tie that, that in, you know? Uh, and after a while, they just stopped trying, and, and I can't blame them for that. Uh, but here well, we that, are. That, that, you know, Jim, is maybe... The blessing and the curse of, of the story. You know, we talked before, and I, I told you, I sort of think about Walt Disney World as in terms of layers of the onion. And on its most basic level, on the most basic layer, it's the place where families can come together and enjoy attractions and shows and meeting princesses and things like that. And as you start to dig deeper and deeper, there's more to explore, there's more to enjoy. And at the sort of the very bottom layer, the deepest layer of that onion, is like what we're doing now. We're talking about those stories because they're not... You can't walk up to the theater, the, the Sunset Hills Estates, and piece that story together necessarily on your own. That's the good and the bad, is that they're there, and yes, when something new comes in, they need to create a story, but because it's not told, it's not sort of put on a park map, 
explaining what it is, it's often lost on guests when maybe to a certain degree they don't mind if, if a, you know, a, a modern rock and roll roller coaster is right next to this tower hotel from the 30s. Well, I, I think one of the things that's wonderful about the Disney theme parks is it's a living thing. And even stories are living things. You know, when you communicate a, a story, sometimes you'll put a little uh, a change in it. You'll leave out part of the story or you'll add in another part or whatever. The, it's, a, it's a living, breathing thing, and I think that's part of, of the magic. I'm, I, I'm not such a fanatic that it's like, this should be exactly the way it was the very first time I experienced it. I would like some of the similar things, and I would like, um, I think the modern way of explaining it is I'd like them to keep some of the same DNA, you know, into the attraction. Uh, for instance, Star Tours just changed. I think that change is terrific because it keeps it keeps the DNA of the original attraction. You know, it, it's that whole spirit, all that, but it's enriched it uh, uh, tremendously. You know, I, I don't I don't object to the queue in uh, in Haunted Mansion out here, or or to adding uh, uh, Jack Sparrow into uh, uh, Pirates of the Caribbean because I feel both of those things did not impact, you know, the experience that I love. It did not contradict uh, what was going on, you know, so you can do that. And, you know, before we sign off, one of the things we should uh, recommend to people is uh, uh, our good friend uh, Werner Weiss has a website called www.werner, uh, not Werner Weiss, uh, www.yesterland.com. And he did a uh, three-part series on uh, all of the buildings in uh, on Hollywood Boulevard and on Sunset. So he shows not only um, uh, the building, but the building that inspired it and where that building is and what the changes were and, and made. You know, there's so many people out there and uh, I thank all of them who, who are doing such great research, research that I love and I'm thankful that they're doing it and I don't have to uh, for all of that. And I, I hope those of you who are listening uh, enjoyed this little trip down uh, Sunset just as you uh, enjoyed the trip up uh, Hollywood Boulevard. And, uh, Lou, yeah, and, 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 well, look, like the idea of what we try to do on the show and in the audio guides and everything else like that is that... We can't, uh, no matter how much time we took, Jim, we wouldn't be able to give every single detail. But the idea is to introduce you to some of those deeper storylines that maybe you would miss otherwise. To show you some of the details that you might not have picked up and, and ask you and invite you to look up and look around. Yeah, even talk to some of the cast members too. And start to peel back some of those layers a little bit deeper. Because I think what happens, Jim, is you get a, 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 it doesn't spoil the magic, it enhances your appreciation. And that's what I try and do with, with the show and everything I produce is enhance your appreciation and enjoyment of the parks. And whether it's your 10th time here or thousandth time to the park, there is a lot more that maybe you never realized or maybe never saw, even though it's been there in front of you the whole time. So uh, nobody is a, is a better storyteller than you, Jim Corcus. You, I love having you on the show. I love having you contribute to Celebrations Magazine. I, of course, love recommending to people who are fans of the Disney parks and Walt Disney and Disney animation and Disney history your first book, uh, The Vault of Walt. I'll put a link to it in this week's show notes. Certainly want to have you come back again and again and again as we continue to explore all the theme parks and the hotels uh, because there is so much more to explore. And I uh, appreciate you coming down and taking a trip back in time with me down Sunset Boulevard. My pleasure, Lou, and all I can say is I'm ready for my close-up. So I said at the introduction that I wanted to bring back a segment that I haven't done in really a long time, miss doing these because I love not only sharing Disney World history and trivia with you, but having you be involved, be engaged, and giving you a chance to win. So I'm going to bring back, hopefully, as a weekly feature segment, a Walt Disney World trivia question of the week. Now, sometimes it could be a trivia question. Sometimes it could be a soundbite, a where in the world have you heard this, but it gives you a chance to play and win, and I'll give away prizes like all six of my audio tour to Walt Disney World CDs, Back issues of Celebrations Magazine, limited edition WW Radio five-year anniversary pins, and lots more. It could be iTunes gift cards, Disney gift cards. You never know from week to week what you may have a chance to win. 
So let's kick this segment off with our first returning Walt Disney World trivia question of the week. So in honor of the legacy and passing of Robert Sherman and his brother Richard joining us on the cruise in November, here is your trivia question of the week. The Sherman brothers created many memorable theme park songs in addition to all their work in the movies, sometimes with even more than one song playing in a single attraction or attraction pavilion. But for what Walt Disney World attraction or pavilion did the brothers create three original songs? I want you to tell me the name of the pavilion and the three songs they created. You can email your answers to lou at www.radio.com. Send them in by Sunday, March 18th at 11.59 p.m. And I'll announce the winner on next week's show. Also be sure to include your name and email address so I can get back to you if you are the winner. Again, email them to lou at www.radio.com by Sunday, March 18th at 11.59 p.m. And the winner for our first trivia question of the week is going to win a prize package that includes all six audio tours to Walt Disney World on CD. Main Street, Adventureland, Fantasyland, Toontown, Liberty Square, and Frontierland. I'll also send you a back issue of Celebrations Magazine and a limited edition WW Radio five-year anniversary pin. And you know what? Since it is about and for the Sherman Brothers, I'll also include a $10 iTunes gift card so you can download the Sherman Brothers songbook and keep that on your iPad or mobile device. Again, hope you enjoy the return of the trivia question of the week. Again, one week it might be a question one week it might be a where in the world if you heard this sound hope to see you guys get involved and have some fun good luck That's going to do it for this week's show. Thanks again for taking the time and tuning in this and every week. Don't forget to come by the website at www.radio.com. Click on the link for this week's episode number 265 under the podcast tab. Leave your comments in the comment section either about the episode or maybe some things you found as you wandered down Hollywood and Sunset Boulevards. While you're on the site, be sure and take some time. Look around the all-new www.radio.com website. We have multiple blog posts throughout the day contests, discussion forums, polls, videos, and lots more there as well. Also, I want to say a quick thanks to everybody who came out this past weekend to the ESPN Wide World of Sports, joined us for the WW Radio Day at the Ballpark for Braves Yankees Spring Training. Had a great time hanging out on the lawn, getting to meet some of you in and out of the box. Don't forget to find out more about future meets and uh, monthly meetups in Walt Disney World, you can visit www.radio.com slash events or click on the events tab at the top of the page. Speaking of future events, don't forget, we also have the WW Radio Cruise on the Disney Dream November 4th through the 8th, 2012. Of course, we are well underway in planning group events, meets, and surprises along the way. Of course, you know by now that our very special guest is going to be none other than Disney legend, Richard M. Sherman of the Sherman Brothers. He is going to be sharing his stories, music, and a lot more with just our group. It's not going to be up for the entire ship, only for people who book as part of our group. So I recommend very highly going to www.radiocruise.com. Get some more information. Get a no-obligation quote. And if you can, book as soon as possible as cabins are selling very, very quickly. And it is booking up fast. We are going to have a great time on this cruise, just like we did last year. Again, I think it's going to be even bigger and better than it was before. Speaking of Richard Sherman, I do want to take a, a quick pause and just say that uh, if you visit the WW Radio blog, I did share my thanks and tribute to his brother, Robert Sherman, who passed away just this past week on March 5th. Uh, we also have a tribute to him coming up in, an, in a future issue of Celebrations Magazine. I think that the extended Disney family and all of us who are fans of the theme park music and his, their music and films really felt a sense of loss this week. So it's going to make it even more special to have his brother Richard sharing his music and his stories about growing up and working with his brother on the cruise with us. Again, more information over at www.radiocruise.com. Finally, don't forget, I want the show to be interactive. I want to hear from you. So if you have a question you want answered on the show, you can email me at lou at www.radio.com. Or if you want to be heard on the air, you can call the voicemail, 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1. In addition to the podcast and the videos, be sure and check out our weekly live video broadcast and chat every Wednesday night at 7.30 p.m. Eastern. 
over at www.radiolive.com. There we'll talk about the week's uh, Walt Disney World news in a live interactive discussion forums. And if you can't make it live, that's okay. I'll post the video over on YouTube, on the blog, and I'll post the audio in the iTunes feed as well. Quick thanks to my partners and sponsors, including Mouse Fan Travel, Becky and her team, who are helping us put together again what I think is going to be a really exciting cruise. Can also help you with your trips to Disney World, Disneyland, Adventures by Disney, anything in between. Becky and her team give you not only the best possible prices, discounts, but an amazing level of personal service. It's who I use. You can find them over at mousefantravel.com. When you're coming to Walt Disney World, maybe you want something a little bit bigger. Maybe you're bringing the extended family Check out allstarvacationhomes.com. They have 150 homes within just a few miles of Walt Disney World with pools, pit, kitchens, spas, game rooms, and lots more. And if you want to stay right in the heart of Walt Disney World, visit the Walt Disney World Swan and Dolphin over at swananddolphin.com. They not only have wonderful accommodations, the most heavenly beds, literally, on property, the Mandara Spa, but also go over, check out some of their restaurants and lounges. They've got Blue Zoo, Il Molino, Shula's, fresh and lots more and again you can visit them online at swananddolphin.com and as always my friends and you are my friends whether we have met yet or not all i ask is that if you like the show please help spread the word let others know about it tell your friends and family tweet out that you're listening share links or images on facebook or google plus or pinterest and please come by rate and review the show over in itunes as well very much appreciated and please also remember that every day for you is filled with opportunity. So go out, go seize it, go make your own, and start doing what you love every day. And when you do, always keep moving forward. Thank you again so very much for letting me share my passion with you and for tuning in this and every week. So until next time, have a great week, everybody. See ya. Hey, Lou, it's Glenn from Alabama. Uh, I feel like I always call in about the same thing, but this is a little bit more special. I'm not even finished listening to your top ten uh, attraction vehicles, but this is probably the best uh, top ten uh, podcast that you've done. Uh, you and Tim are in rare form. Uh, love your banter. Uh, my favorite segment on the show is your top ten list. Never stop doing those. Um, but great show. Uh, I, I've laughed, um, I've cried, no I haven't cried, but um, wonderful show, wonderful idea to do, um, and um, uh, being the, uh, the the fellow Disney geek that I am, I actually listened to just enough of this show on one of my commutes to um, uh, to hear that it, what the topic was, and I came home that night, and <laughs> my family and I actually made our own top ten list. And I was going to see how close I got to the list that you guys put together. And it was pretty close. I think everything on my list y'all at least mentioned. But uh, love the show. Uh, love the top ten list. Uh, love the interaction between you and Tim. Um, thanks a lot. Uh, it's so rare that I get down to Disney World. But I, I love Disney World so much. So uh, listening to your podcast really gives me the opportunity to almost feel like I'm there and uh, have other people uh, that I know that are out there who, who, who share that love. And just thank you so much for what you do, and keep on doing it. And uh, uh, go top ten list. Don't ever, don't ever take those away. Hope to meet you soon. Hey, Lou, this is Cindy Mal 6 in Chattanooga, Tennessee, and just finished listening to the podcast. And we are DVC members, and the thing that we love most for the kids is they love going to the um, the kids' activity clubs at, Dis, um, at Old Key West. That's our favorite one. Our second favorite is the Saratoga Springs. Um, they have, like, free video games and Xboxes and Wiis and doing all kinds of stuff. So, oh, and in the beach club, they have all kinds of really cool um, pool games, etc. So, that's I wanted to let you know that. Also, we're looking forward to going back with you guys on the Disney Dream. We're actually bringing all four of the kids this time. I look forward to it, and the kids are looking forward to it as well. I will see you soon. Bye. Hey, Lou. This is Randy from Kansas City, Missouri. I am finally standing on Main Street. It's been two and a half years since I've been here. I've been trying to get back. I've been fighting illnesses, and I've finally, finally gotten back. I'm so excited. 
my first walk down Main Street in a long time. Well, for me, a long time. Anyway, love your show. Just want to call you from Main Street Live from Disney World. Thank you. Have a magical day. Bye-bye. You got a friend in me. Yeah.